What's up, church? Good morning. Are you happy to be here? Good, good. Well, I'm going to start my message off this morning in a kind of unconventional way by asking you guys a question. And if I'm honest with you guys here this morning, the youth guy in me laughs a little bit every time I think about it. So here it goes. Who's your mama? Now, no need to blurt out your mother's name. No need to answer. It's probably not what you think anyway. You see, that question is the title to my sermon here this morning. Who's your mama? I want you to kind of think about that as we go throughout the message. And you might hear me say that over and over, but it's really important that you are able to answer that question in the context of today's message. You see, we're in a series called The Grace Effect, and this series, it's all about the grace of God. It's all about God's unmerited favor. Throughout this series, we've learned that Paul, he is defending his apostleship. He's defending the true gospel that he was given by Jesus Christ that he delivered to these Galatian believers. He's teaching that our right standing before God does not come uh, on our own works, but in the grace of God and what God has done for us. And it's received by faith alone in Jesus Christ alone. You see, it's all about faith versus works, grace versus the law. This series is summed up in a passage of scripture found in Ephesians chapter 2. For by grace you've been saved through faith. It's not of your own doing. You can't earn it. You can't work for it. But it is a gift of God so that no one can boast. You have no right to boast because it's all a work of God. And ultimately that's what this message, this book, this letter Paul wrote to the Galatian believers is all about. And you know what? I hope you've enjoyed your journey so far throughout the book of Galatians. Today, we are going to conclude the fourth chapter of the book. And over the next couple of chapters, Paul is going to get more into the application of what he's been kind of power driving into our minds over the last several weeks. And so I'm excited to get into that, but let's close out the chapter here this morning. You know what's kind of funny about this passage? And it's going to be funny to y'all, but not so much me. Most commentators have said that Galatians chapter 4 verses 21 through 31, which is the text that I'm preaching on here this morning, is one of the most difficult texts in all of the New Testament. And to that I say, thanks, Jason. Like, come on, dude, really? The youth guy, you give this difficult passage, but I, I am excited here this morning to preach on this text. You see, it's ultimately going to walk us through a shameful story, one that we wish wasn't even in the Bible that takes place in the book of Genesis. But it's also going to reveal to you and I that we can and need to be able to answer the question that I asked at the beginning of the sermon. Who's yo mama? Like you need to answer that question. And although the text, it's going to seem kind of confusing because of Paul's style of teaching that he's going to use in this text. It's really not that difficult to understand what Paul is trying to say. And so I'm going to kind of summarize my entire message in just this one thought. And what you need to know is like this is the point of the entire message, okay? The law enslaves you and grace sets you free. It's not about what I can do for God. It's about what God has done for me. And even though persecution will come, we are reminded that in Christ we have won. And in one simple phrase, that is the entire message preached. But because you gathered here this morning and because God called me to preach, I'm going to continue to elaborate if you will allow me. Uh, I'm super excited. You see this text, it's split up into kind of three categories And these three categories are going to be kind of the points to my message here this morning. The first is the question. The second thing we're going to look at in the next text is the allegory. And then we're finally going to conclude with the exhortation. 
And so let's jump right in to the question. Now, I've added this tag with the thought, the question, do you know what you're doing? Because ultimately that's what Paul is asking these Galatian believers in this first section of Scripture. Galatians 21 through 23. You guys with me? Let's look at the text. The Word of God says, Tell me, you who desire to be under the law, do you not listen to the law? For it is written that Abraham had two sons, one by a slave woman and one by a free woman. But the son of the slave was born according to the flesh, while the son of the free woman was born through the promise. You see, what's happening here, what Paul is addressing is these Galatian believers are being tempted by these false teachers that have crept into the churches at Galatia and they are coming in teaching that the Galatian believers, that they need to be like the Jews to be truly saved. Basically what they're saying is that, yeah, faith in Jesus Christ is all good and well. You need to do that. But that's not good enough. They didn't stop there. They said that you need to be like the Jews to be truly saved. And so what Paul is doing here in this first verse, 21, he is asking them, do you not listen to the law? Like you need to understand what it is these false teachers are leading you into. Do you not understand the law? The real question he's asking, it's this. Do you want to be enslaved under the law or do you want to be free in Christ? That's the questions I'm going to ask you to wrestle with here this morning. Do you want to be enslaved under the law or do you want to be free in Jesus? You see, Paul's example that he's going to use to get these believers to understand the weight of his question is he's going to reference an Old Testament story, much like he's been doing so far. Don't you guys remember, as we've been walking through the book of Galatians, he's been referencing the, the person, Abraham. And he's made many points using the story of Abraham. And what we're going to do here this morning is we're going to continue on in that story. And like I said a moment ago, we're going to kind of look at a shameful story. One that we as believers kind of wish wasn't in the Bible. It's kind of shameful for us to look at, but it's true. It's a historical, biblical account of what has happened. But these false teachers that have slipped in, they would use the Old Testament and the law to make their case. And so Paul, he's just going to go right to the law of the Old Testament, and he's going to make his case, and he's going to lay it out there, and it's going to be faith versus works. And here's what's true of everybody in the room today. You get to choose how you relate to Christ. We're going to get to that here in just a moment. So he continues in the story of Abraham. What we know so far is that God has called a man named Abram, and he has called him out of his land. So where he was raised, he tells him he's going to take him somewhere else that he's going to show him, and he's going to give him a seed that through his seed, The entire earth is going to be blessed. Whoever blesses his nation will be blessed, and whoever curses his nation will be cursed. And it's this great, great promise, this promise of blessings, this promise of a great nation coming from him. But there was kind of a problem that is going to be addressed here as we look at this story. It's that Abraham, when he received the promise, was already 75 years old. And his wife was 65. And some time has now gone by since God made the initial promise and Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. But now about 11 years has passed and Abraham's not getting any younger. Neither is his wife. And even up to this point, she's barren, unable to have children. And so we kind of run into this dilemma in the story where God's promised something great to Abraham, but he's kind of failed to follow through from the perspective of Abraham and Sarah. And so What happens is rather than responding to the promise of God by faith and waiting as long as it takes for God to fulfill his promise, and I just want to say this, one thing we can know for certain about God is that when he promises something, he's going to come through, amen? Like God comes through, he fulfills his promises, but time has passed and it's ticking and Abraham and Sarah aren't exactly in their childbearing prime, are they? They're getting up there in age and so... Sarah and Abraham do 
what we are all capable and often guilty of doing. They take matters into their own hands. Like God's promised them, clear as day, here's what I'm going to do. All you got to do is have faith. It's going to happen. And as the time clicks on, they're like, maybe God needs our help. Have you ever had that thought? Like, like God, God makes all these promises in Scripture, and you're just like waiting for them to come true. And you're like, well, maybe God needs my help. Well, let me just say, that's a huge mistake. God is more than able to accomplish his purpose, especially in the sense of this promise. And he doesn't need our help to accomplish his promises, okay? And so Sarah comes to Abraham. She's like, hey, uh, since God's kind of slow on fulfilling his promise, maybe he needs our help. How about I send my servant into you and we will have a child through her? And so... Abraham, rather than responding the way that he should have, which was like, hold up, woman. God made us a promise, and I'm going to believe God. Because that would have been the appropriate response for a God-fearing husband, right? Because we as husbands, are we not supposed to lead our families spiritually? Like Abraham should have taken the reins there and put a halt to what Sarah had requested and they could have just walked in the faithfulness of God, but he listened to his wife. And so husbands, maybe you should listen to what happened in the story here. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Listen to your wives. Happy wife, happy life, right? But we are to lead our families well. When God promises us things, we don't hear other responses that go in opposition to what God has said. But that's exactly what Abraham does. And so Sarah sends Hagar into Abraham and a child is conceived. Now, this is about 11 years from the initial promise. And uh, they've taken matters into their own hands. And here's what we need to know about that. When we do that, when we place ourselves outside the will of God, when he has told us something and we do the opposite thinking that we know more than God, we should not expect that to go well. We cannot expect to be walking outside of the will of God to go well for us. We should not expect God's blessing when we are out of his will. And so that's exactly what happens in this story. I mean, what, what else could happen? You see, when Hagar conceives the child, that is when the baby mama drama starts. Now, I don't know how familiar you are with the story, but it was Sarah's recommendation that Abraham take her servant. But as soon as she gets pregnant with Abraham's child, she is not about it anymore. She's all upset about it. I mean, think about it. Some of you that are married here this morning, can you just imagine if there was a second woman in the picture? You probably wouldn't be too happy about that, would you? So she starts to treat Abraham poorly. He's probably thinking, God, what did I do? She starts to treat Hagar poorly, and it's just this nightmarish situation. She's barren, unable to have children. They try to take things into their own hands, and it becomes this disastrous situation. And what you need to know is this. What they did, the decision that they made, did not please God. He did not commend their decision. He did not accept their decision. He was not happy with their decisions. So about 10 years later, or 13 years later, rather, he comes to Abraham again, and he said, what you've done isn't what I said I would do. I'm going to give you a child, and you're going to name this child Isaac. And when Abraham was 99, 100 years old, God fulfilled his promise to Abraham and Sarah, and they had a child. But what we see in the story is Ishmael, which is Hagar's child with Abraham, is the first son. And Isaac, which is Abraham and Sarah's son, is the second son. The difference between the two is the first son, Ishmael, was not the one born according to the promise. He was the child conceived according to the flesh. But then we have the second child, Isaac. He is the fulfillment of God's promise. He is the supernatural, miraculous 
child given to Abraham and Sarah, the one in which he would fulfill his promises to Abraham through. Not born of flesh, not born of human effort, but born of promise. So what's, what's kind of going on here, why he, he's alluding to this specific story, Paul, in this text, is these false teachers that are creeping in trying to lead these Galatian believers astray, what they would often do is they would claim that they are the sons of of Abraham. Do y'all remember a couple weeks ago, for those of you that weren't here, our lead pastor Jason, he was preaching about this point and he sang the, the old song that we used to sing as children. Father Abraham had many sons. They're like, that's us. We're Abraham's son. But what's Paul saying here in this text? He says, Abraham had two sons. Abraham had Two sons. And so they would make the case that Abraham was their father. And by default, all the promises and blessings that were promised and given to Abraham, they would apply those promises and blessings to themselves. The problem with their line of thinking, and Paul addresses it, is this. Abraham had two sons. So the question that Paul is addressing ultimately in the text isn't whether or not these false teachers are the physical descendants of Abraham. You see, the question to ask isn't who's your daddy, it's who's your mama. That's what Paul is saying here in this story. Are you a descendant of Sarah or Hagar? Because these women represent two covenants. Only one brings salvation. That's what you need to hear. It's not enough to say you're a child of Abraham. You need to answer the question, who's your mama? I want to ask you this, just to kind of drive home this point that I'm making with what Paul's saying here in these first couple of passages. Have you ever wanted or desired something deeply that you thought would make your life better? or that would make you more happy? Well, I'll tell you a story. There was a time in my life when I was about 18, 19 years old where I got really into coon hunting. Does anybody know what coon hunting is? Okay, raccoon hunting, right? So uh, basically the whole concept behind coon hunting is you get a couple of dogs, you go up into the mountains, out into the woods, or along a riverbank, and you let those dogs out. Those dogs are trained to go track coons. They'll chase a coon up a tree. They'll howl a distinct howl to let you know they got one in a tree, and you go track them down, and you harvest the coon. Like, I, I love this. Me and my buddy, we work night shift. We'd go out. We'd coon hunt till 3 or 4 in the morning. We got into some scary situations out in those mountains, let me tell you that. But... I love to coon hunt. The problem was this. I didn't have a coon dog. My buddy had two. He had two coon dogs. And so this started to develop as like a passion in my life. And I wanted to go as much as I could. But I was dependent on my buddy and his coon dogs to be able to go. And so I started to desire that I would have my own coon dog. And so I told my dad, I said, hey, I'm into coon hunting. What can you do? Can you help me out? And he said, yeah, I know a guy. So he calls up his buddy. And about two or three days later, right there on my front porch when I got home from work, coon dog was sitting on the porch. Registered, blue tick, coon hound. It was the prettiest dog you'd ever seen. Already trained to track and, uh, and get coons. And I was like, my life's going to be great. This is going to be the best thing ever. Until that night rolled around. Do you know what coon dogs like to do when it gets nighttime? They like to howl. They like to howl loudly. And they don't stop throughout the entire night. And I lived on a small piece of property at the time. And the truth be told, that stinking coon dog laid outside underneath my bedroom window all night long. And I didn't get any sleep. And so for about the three days that dog was in my possession before I made a phone call to come get that thing, I had to deal with the repercussions of desiring my own coon dog. Here's what's happening in this text. The Apostle Paul, he's saying this. If those that desire to be under the law, they need to understand what it means to be under the law. I had to learn the hard way what it meant to have my own 
coon dog. And so Paul's point in making the distinction between the two sons is if the Galatian believers that desire to be under the law, they need to know what that means. They need to know that the law promises slavery. It doesn't promise freedom. The law will enslave them when they've already been set free. To choose the law is choosing to be trapped by the demands of something that can never be met for you and I. We can't fulfill the law. You see, throughout the rest of the passage, Paul, he's going to, He's going to look at this story that I've just shared with you, but he's going to look at it in an allegorical way. He's going to show these believers that we've been set free as sons and daughters of God and of the promise that grace and freedom is much more desirable than the law and slavery. But he warns us. He says this. He says, I'm not about to exegete this passage. I'm not going verse by verse, word by word. I'm telling the whole story that spans like seven, seven chapters of Scripture in an allegorical way. And so you may ask, what's an allegory? Well, great question. It's a story, a poem, or a picture that can be interpreted to reveal a hidden meaning. Typically, it's a moral story or a political one, but in this case, it's a spiritual one. And what I want to say about that, just because we're getting into it and some of you are going to hear only this part of the sermon, I want you to hear this. We have to be careful when we read Scripture. We have to be careful not to allegorize every single story or every single thing we read in Scripture. Okay, not everything's meant to be interpreted this way. But Paul, in this text, writing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit of God, writing to us Scripture, he has the right to do so as an apostle. And so he interprets a true historical account in an allegorical way. And so let's read what he has to say. Verse 24. Now this may be interpreted allegorically. These women are two covenants. One is from Mount Sinai, bringing children, bearing children for slavery. She is Hagar. Now, Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia. She corresponds to the present Jerusalem, for she is in slavery with her children. But the Jerusalem above is free. She's our mother. For it's written, Rejoice, O barren one who does not bear. Break forth and cry aloud, you who are not in labor. For the children of the desolate one will be more than those of the one who has a husband. And so what Paul's telling us here is he's, he's elaborating on the story that he told us in the first three verses. And he says, well, it can actually be interpreted with this hidden meaning. Here it is. The two women, Sarah and Hagar, they represent two covenants. First, we see Hagar. Hagar represents Mount Sinai, which is where the law was given to Moses. She represents the Judaizers, these false teachers, these religious, self-righteous people that relate to God a specific way. They relate to God on the basis of their own works, not on the basis of what God has done for them. And so they're willing to say, yeah, faith in Jesus Christ is needed, but that's not enough. They don't stop there. She represents these people. She represents those that are convinced that faith alone and Jesus Christ alone is not good enough. And so they would say, if you're a Gentile, for you to be truly saved, you need to be like the Jew. But then we see Sarah. Sarah is the second woman. Sarah represents the Jerusalem above. She she represents everybody that is free in Christ. Those that by faith have trusted in Jesus for their salvation. Not according to the works of the law. Not according to the works of the flesh. But according to God's Promise. You see, God promised Abraham and Sarah that he would give them a child that would bless all the nations of the earth. And Isaac was a partial fulfillment of that promise, but Jesus Christ was the ultimate fulfillment of that promise. What God had in mind when he promised this to Abraham all the way in the beginning, his, his, what he had in mind was Jesus dying on the cross for our sins bringing to us salvation that we cannot earn or have apart from him. 
You see, what's true of all of us that are here this morning is this. We have sinned against God. The Bible says this clear as day, for all have sinned and come short of God's glory. There is none of us that can make it to heaven on our own. You see, what's true is this. When we come, what we bring to the table when it comes to our salvation is sin. We bring sin, and Jesus Christ brings the work of salvation. He brings the forgiveness. He brings the, the, the covering, the payment of our sin. He's the one that took the wrath of God on the cross, and his work paid for our salvation. It's not that works are bad. They just can't save us. They have no power to save. You see, we don't come to Christ on our own merit or good works, we trust in the work of Jesus on the cross. You see, I hope you're getting it. You're either a son of Hagar, which is a son of slavery, or you're a son of Sarah, which is a son to freedom. Who's your mama? Can you answer that question? What we see being contrasted is two types of people. Those who trust in themselves, their own efforts, their own ability to please God for their salvation, or those that realize they have absolutely nothing to offer God. They come in their spiritual brokenness, their spiritual deadness, and plead to God, I have nothing to offer you, save me. Paul, in this allegorical way, he's condemning those that wish to relate to God through the works of their flesh. It's a a condemnation for Abraham and for Sarah to turn to Hagar when God promised them a son. You see, we're all born once into this world. That's called being born according to the flesh. Your parents did something You were conceived and you were born. That's the first birth. The Bible tells us Jesus specifically says you must be born again. According to the Holy Spirit of God, something must happen. A spiritual work must take place in your heart for you to be saved. The law was never meant to save anybody. It was meant to point us to our need for a Savior. We're either sons of Hagar or Sarah. Those are the only two ways to relate to Christ when it's all boiled down. Sons of slavery and legalism and self-righteousness, never being able to have a relationship with God because you're not good enough, or sons of the promise, those that believe by faith in Jesus Christ alone and the fulfillment of God's promise for their salvation can be saved. So I will lastly want to look at Paul's exhortation the final verses of the passage says now you brothers like Isaac are children of promise but just as at that time he who was born according to the flesh persecuted him who was born according to the spirit so also is it now but what does the scripture say cast out the slave woman and her son for the son of the slave woman shall not inherit with the son of the free woman so brothers we're not children of the slave but of the free woman Woman, this is kind of the defining turning point of what Paul's saying as he wraps up the fourth chapter. He clearly says this, the gospel that I preach to you is the true gospel. Don't believe anything else added to that. Jesus is sufficient. Faith in Christ is what is needed for salvation. And anybody else, that comes in saying anything besides that, cast them out. Cast them out. You see, there's no room in the church for self-righteous legalism that is trying to feed God's people a message that Jesus isn't enough and that they need to enslave them in a system that was never meant to save them. 
Don't go under the law. Paul is saying throughout this entire thing, do you understand what it is you're desiring to do? You want to return to a system that cannot give you freedom when Christ already has. So what are we to do? Cast them out. Why? Because we know who our mama is. What he says to these Galatian believers, he says, you are like Isaac. Who's Isaac's mama? Sarah. You are born of the free woman. See, what's going on here while Paul is encouraging these believers is because they're facing persecution. Like Paul faced persecution. And he's trying to encourage them to walk in the freedom of the true gospel. But this is the history of the entire Bible in the Old Testament all the way through the New. Our biggest enemy at times isn't the world that does hate us and persecutes us. It's those that say they're Christians that truly aren't. Those that are self-righteous, those that are caught up in legalism. You see, the prophets of old were killed by God's people for calling them to repent. Jesus, in his day, as he walked on the earth, his biggest opposition wasn't Rome. It was the Pharisees and the religious leaders. Those are the ones that put him on the cross. And in Paul's day, his biggest enemy wasn't Rome. He appealed to Rome because of the persecution he faced at the hands of the self-righteous religious leaders. And so why should we expect it to be any different today? Cast them out. Before you decide here this morning to place yourself under a system of rules and regulations you might think will make God love you more, I want you to hear what I have to say. Good works are great. They may make you look good. They may make you feel good. They may even bless you on the right side of salvation. But they cannot save you. Please hear me. Some of you relate to God this way. Some of you are here today and the only way that you can ever say that you've related to God is on what you have done for him. It's not about that. It's about what God has done for you. You bring nothing to the table. So I want to ask you this final question as I close. How do you relate to God? You answered that question. How do you relate to God? One final time for the sake of it. Who's your mama? Sarah or Hagar? Are you depending on your own works or are you trusting in the work of Jesus? For only one brings salvation. If you're here today and you've never trusted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, I'll be up here as we have a time of response. I'd love to visit with you. I'd love to take God's word and show you how you can be saved. It's very simple. The word of God says you must call upon the name of the Lord and you'll be saved. If you're here today and you're saved, but man, the way that you've been relating to God here lately is by what you can do for him. You're probably walking in shame. You're probably walking in all the failures that the law, the standard of God has been putting on you. I would ask you to repent. Begin to relate to God by the finished work of the cross where there's no condemnation for those that are in Christ. And if you're here today and you've suffered persecution, and we kind of say that and it doesn't seem to make sense here in America, but you need to know that there are millions of believers all across this place all across this world that are suffering for the sake of Christ. If you've suffered persecution at the hands of legalism that slipped its way into the church, I want you to hear me. There is healing and there is hope in Jesus. We're a bunch of people that are sinners and messed up and we need Jesus. We need Jesus and there's hope in him. So let me pray for you. We're going to have a time of response. I'm going to ask you guys to stand when I finish praying. Respond how the Lord would lead you. Let's pray. Father, we love you. We thank you for your word. God, I thank you for just the gift of Jesus dying on the cross for our sins. God, that we don't have to try to work or earn our salvation. God, but you give it freely in him. 
God, I pray for the one or the many that's here relating to you according to their works, God, and they seem to be doing nothing but failing, God, and they never feel good enough. They never feel like they have any peace or hope. God, I pray that they would give it all away, God, and just surrender their lives to you. God, I pray that you'd move in a mighty way. Whatever that looks like, God, we turn this time over to you. Just ask your spirit to fall out on us, Lord, now. Pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen. You guys can stand. I would ask you to respond as the Lord would lead.